This is lecture 5J, and today we're going to talk about the first law of thermodynamics. First, a couple of definitions. The system is going to be defined as any part of the universe that we want to focus in on. So for chemistry, we like to focus in on a particular chemical reaction. So this may be the reactants and products that are um, taking place and reacting inside of, say, a beaker. If the system is the part of the universe we want to focus on, and then everything else is considered the surroundings. So that would be the rest of the universe, like the glass of the beaker itself, the air around it, etc. And thermodynamics involves energy of systems. And so what we want to talk about is the amount of energy that our system has. And the total energy content of a system is known as its internal energy and is abbreviated by the letter E. That would be the total energy content of a system. Now, we've learned how to experimentally determine how much heat is given off or absorbed in a chemical reaction. That would be done with calorimeter. And we've determined how to produce or how to predict the amount of heat given off or absorbed in a chemical reaction theoretically. We did that earlier in this unit with bond energies, and we've recently been doing it based upon Hess's law and using standard heat of formations. Why is this number important? because the heat released by a chemical reaction represents the maximum amount of work we can get from that reaction. And it turns out that the only way a system or a chemical reaction can release or absorb heat and that amount of energy that it gains or loses is abbreviated delta E, it can only happen in two ways. The energy released or absorbed by a system can either happen in by the reaction or the system releasing heat energy or absorbing heat energy. Heat, which is abbreviated by a lowercase q, is any amount of energy that's transferred in or out of a system that causes a temperature change. So if you have a chemical reaction taking place in a test tube and it's an exothermic process where it's releasing heat energy to the water and the glass of the test tube, you can feel that in your hands, the test tube starts to get hot. What kind of transfer of energy is that? It could be photons of electromagnetic radiation being released as the reactant molecules, electrons shift around to different orbitals. And if they release energy when they do that, those photons uh, are escaping from the reactant molecules. They strike either the molecules of water or the molecules of glass. The water molecules or the glass molecules absorb the amount of energy from those photons of electromagnetic radiation and they increase. And so if they increase their energy content for molecules, they start to move more. They start to vibrate more or roll more. And we know that is correlated to an increase in temperature because temperature is a measure of the motion of molecules, their kinetic energy. So if a reaction gives off energy and all of the surrounding molecules around it increase their energy in a random fashion so that they're now moving with a higher velocity, so a higher kinetic energy, then they cause a temperature change, a temperature rise to take place. So this is called energy being transferred in the form of heat. But there's a second way that energy can be transformed. It can be transferred rather in the form of work, which is abbreviated by a lowercase w. This is any energy that's transferred that actually causes an object to move. Or in other words, it's due to a change in the concerted motion of the molecules in an object. If you have a gaseous chemical reaction taking place in a test tube and you have a stopper on it, if the reaction occurs that produces a gas, it could actually cause that stopper to pop out of the test tube and fly across the room. So the energy released by that reaction has not caused the molecules of the stopper to start moving more randomly. All of the molecules in that stopper are all moving in the same direction and that causes the object to move or change its position. So whenever energy is released from a process and it causes an object to move as an entire unit, and that's why it's called the concerted motion of the molecules because they're all, all the molecules in the stopper, for example, would be moving together. And that's why you say that when you go to a, a symphony concert, what's a concert mean? It means all the violins are moving together with each other. So due to a change in the concerted motion of the molecules causing an object to move, that amount of energy that's released from a process is called work. And so anytime a process changes its internal energy, it either releases energy causing all the molecules in the surrounding to increase random motion, and that causes the temperature to go up is how we measure it, or they can cause molecules in the surroundings to move together in a concerted effort, 
which causes a, a, sub, a substance to move. And anytime something moves from an energy of a process, we call that energy transfer work. Now, this is related to what we call the first law of thermodynamics. And this states that the internal energy of a system can only change by these two processes, which are known as heat or work. We can write this algebraically. The first law of thermodynamics can be written as delta E, the change in the internal energy of a system, equals Q plus W. So delta E stands for the change in the internal energy of a system. We'll be looking at chemical reactions as our system. And the delta E values sign will be important. If the delta E value is a positive value, that means that the net effect was energy was flowing into the system. If the delta E value is negative, that means the net effect is energy is flowing out of the system. So the sign convention for delta E is positive if energy is absorbed by the system. It's negative if energy is released by a system. Q is the amount of heat that the system or the reaction gives off or absorbed. And because it can give it off or absorb it, we have a sign convention for this as well. And it's exactly the same. Q is going to be a positive number if heat is absorbed by a system. And Q is going to be a negative value if heat is released by a system. And we've been talking about calorimetry and a heat uh, being given off or absorbed in chemical reactions. So we've already seen this definition in play. Work is abbreviated by W. And it's going to be defined uh, in terms of its algebraic sign in a similar fashion. It's going to be positive if work is done on a system. And it's going to be negative if work is done by a system, which means it's done on the surroundings. So because energy can only be transferred between the system and the surroundings according to the first law of thermodynamics, that brings up a corollary to the first law, which is really important. It's that energy is conserved. You never create nor destroy energy because if a system loses energy, it doesn't disappear, it goes into the surroundings. So another way that people sometimes state the first law of thermodynamics is that either energy is conserved or energy can neither be created nor destroyed. So let's look at an example of a first law calculation. We're gonna to try to calculate the change in internal energy of a system if we know that it gains 186 kilojoules of heat and does 33 kilojoules of work on its surroundings. So the equation we're gonna use for this is Q plus W equals the change in internal energy. The key is just recognizing the sign convention for each of the terms. If the system gains 186 kilojoules of heat, that means the heat value is going to be a positive number. So Q is going to wind up being positive 186. If the uh, system does work on the surroundings, that means that energy is flowing out of the system, so it's a negative value. So in this case, the work value would be negative 33. If we calculate delta E by just adding these two together, because it's just Q plus W, paying mind to the signs here, it's really 186 minus 33, and that comes out 153 kilojoules. And because this process inherently absorbs 153 kilojoules of energy when it proceeds, we would call this an endothermic process. So this is how we use the first law equation to calculate changes in internal energy. If you're an engineer and you wind up transferring and working on your degree in engineering, you will take a course on thermodynamics. And when engineers learn the first law of thermodynamics, they define it a little bit differently. So I just want to prep you for that so you don't think I lied to you back in at Saddleback College. We define the change in internal energy as Q plus W. That's how our textbook and most natural sciences write the first law. But because engineers are trying to build devices to create energy to produce work, they want to know how much work can be done on the surroundings. And so for them, it's more relevant to define the work done on the surroundings as a positive number. So in engineering textbooks, they say the first law is delta E equals Q minus W, just because they've made one definition slightly different, and that is they define work as being positive if it's done on the surroundings. So in this case, if we use the engineering form of the first law, delta E equals Q minus W, we would still have 186 for Q, but our W value, because the work is being done on the surroundings, they would make that a positive number. So we would go 186 minus the positive number 33, 
and we would come up with the same answer. The change in internal energy would be 153. But for our engineering majors, I just wanted to make that, uh, that point to you. So let's see some ramifications of this. If you take octane, which is burned in on most of our car engines, and uh, you combust it, that means that in your car engine, the octane is reacting with oxygen that's being pulled in from the air, and it's being sparked by a spark plug in your engine, and that causes it to momentarily burn and create carbon dioxide and water vapor. We've determined in calorimetry experiments that the enthalpy change for this reaction is negative 44.3 kilojoules per gram. The reason we calculate that, as we said at the beginning of today, is that that allows you to predict the maximum amount of work that can be done, in this case, by the burning of one gram of octane. So if we apply this to the first law of thermodynamics, and we decide to do this reaction in a calorimeter, when the reaction occurs, if we have octane in a calorimeter and we spark it or throw a match in, it'll burn, all the energy from that reaction is going to be released as heat. So the Q value for the reaction will be negative 44.3 kilojoules. No work will be done with open calorimeter. Nothing moves. It's just the uh, material combusts and then the reaction ends. So the work value would be zero. If you add these together, you would calculate the change in internal energy for the combustion of octane, which comes out negative 44.3 kilojoules. So if all of the uh, energy is released as heat, then we're getting an idea as to what the maximum change in internal energy can be for the burning of octane. Now, what if you actually had this reaction occur in a container that wasn't open, but it was a container that had a piston on it? Well, the change in internal energy is always going to be negative 44.3 kilojoules because energy change and enthalpy changes are both state functions. They don't depend upon the pathway. So, the change in the property of energy or enthalpy have to always be the same value. But if we do the reaction in a cylinder like this, and we uh, pump in two molecules of CaH18 and 25 molecules of O2 and then combust them with a uh, spark plug, they will turn into 16 molecules of CO2 and 18 molecules of H2O. The significant difference here is you're starting with 27 gaseous molecules and you're ending up after the combustion with 34. So if you increase the number of molecules in the container from 27 to 34, there's going to be more molecules hitting the inside walls of the container, and they'll be hitting the bottom of the, uh, inside bottom of the piston, and they're going to cause the piston to push up. So that pressure that's built up by the more molecules causes a piston to move. That means some of the 44.3 kilojoules was not given off as heat. It was given off as work because it caused all the molecules of the piston to move in concert and go in the upward direction. Now, it's usually not a very, very big fraction of the negative 44.3 that's used uh, to create work. Might be 10% or so, so negative 4.4 kilojoules is actually released when this reaction occurs by work, but we can figure by subtraction the remainder has to be for heat, and so it comes out negative 39.9. This is a reason that car engines get really, really hot. When you burn octane, most of the energy released is given off as heat, but some amount of it is captured as work. In your car engine, this causes the piston to go up. The piston is hooked to uh, your wheels, and as the piston goes up, they turn your wheels slightly. You have several pistons in a row. After this one fires, a microsecond later, the piston next to it sparks its octane and oxygen mixture, causes its piston to move up. That turns the wheels a little bit more, then the third piston fires a microsecond after that, then the fourth, then the fifth, then the sixth, if it's a six-cylinder engine. And that process repeats itself over and over again. So every time the piston, a piston goes up, it moves your wheels. And this happens so often that your wheels will get to move and you actually get to travel in your car based upon the expansion of the product gases in the combustion of octane. Now, if you lived in Brazil, uh, they grow a lot of sugar cane there. And what they do in Brazil is they take their sugar cane and they convert it into ethanol. And that's what they use in their gasolines in that country. So they actually burn ethanol instead of octane as the major component in their car fuel. Turns out the enthalpy change for uh, ethanol is not quite as high. It's only 26.8 kilojoules released per gram, which if you think about it, that means that ethanol doesn't provide as much energy as burning octane does. So a gallon of octane actually gives off more energy than a gallon of ethanol. 
And so if you check car mileages in Brazil, they're always lower by whatever this is, 25% than they are in the United States because when you burn octane, the fuel is more efficient, gives off more energy. We sometimes in California, certain months of the year, the state of California requires that uh, petroleum manufacturers put a certain percentage of ethanol into the gasoline for our cars to help with smog. And so at those months, you may notice that your car mileage decreases because you're running your car on more ethanol than you normally do in the other months. So therefore, it's not as efficient. So your mileage isn't as good. But in, if we uh, apply the same thing to this reaction, the negative 26.8 kilojoules per gram tells us the maximum amount of possible work we could get from burning the ethanol. And if we burn the ethanol in an open calorimeter, the amount of heat given off would be the negative 26.8 kilojoules if we burned one gram of it. Now, no work is done when this happens, so that means the internal energy change would be negative 26.8. It always has to be that number because energy, internal energy like enthalpy are state functions. But if we do this reaction in a container that has a piston in it, then the amount of energy change is still going to be negative 26.8, but because we're placing the ethanol in a container with a movable piston, and when the reaction occurs, you're changing four gas molecules into five gas molecules, the same phenomenon occurs. You build up pressure inside the container, it pushes the piston up, and you get some work done. And it's probably close to the same efficiency, maybe 10% or so. So you would wind up getting 2.7 kilojoules of work instead of the 4.4 from uh, one gram of octane, and the rest would be given off as heat. So once again, by using ethanol, you can cause work to be produced, pistons to move, and you can drive your cars based upon that particular fuel. So how do we calculate how much work is done from a particular chemical reaction? So we're going to talk about that next. So it turns out that if you take physics, you'll study what work is, and work that's done to the surroundings is actually the force multiplied by distance. Writing that algebraically, work equals force times distance. Because it's work done to the surroundings, and the surroundings turns out to be a negative value, we put a negative sign in here, so we get the work of our system to wind up being the right sign. So work equals negative F times D. Now, the reason that a chemical reaction occurs and causes work to happen is you create more gas molecules. They exert a pressure on their container, and they push a piston up. So that pressure that's being exerted inside that cylinder there is going to cause the piston to move. And if the piston starts here and the piston moves up to here, the piston has moved a certain distance. So we can calculate the amount of work from the equation written to the left. It's going to be negative the force multiplied by that distance d right there. So we have to figure out how to get that force then. And the force is actually related to the pressure inside the cylinder. Pressure is defined as force divided by area. And so if we rearrange that equation, P equals F over A, that means the force of the gas inside of the cylinder will equal pressure times the area that it's pushing on. And the area I mean here is the bottom of the cylinder because this is what it caused to move. So it's the pressure being exerted on this area right here. Now, when the piston goes up and stops moving, that's important. We have an equilibrium. That means that the pressure inside or the force that's created by the molecules inside is exactly equal to the force of the molecules on the outside. So that's why it stops moving. So if the force of the air pushing down on the surface of the top of the piston is equal to the force below, the piston will not move. And if this is the area, whatever the area of that circular uh, piston is, then we can make a substitution here. I can substitute in the pressure of the exterior atmosphere multiplied by the area of the piston it's pushing on in place of the force because the force of the atmosphere equals the force of the gas inside the cylinder. So the work done by the gas inside the cylinder is negative P times A times D where P is the external pressure, A is the area of the cylinder or the cylinder top, the piston, and D is the distance that it moved. Now if the piston move from this lower position to the upper position, then what's happened is the volume of the cylinder has changed. And inside here is the change in volume that the cylinder or the piston has undergone. 
So if the change in volume equals the distance it moves up times its area, and if you think about it, that's how you calculate the volume of a cylinder, right? You take the area of the circular end of the cylinder, multiply it by D, then that means that if I just substitute D times A out for change in volume, that means the work done by an expanding gas from a chemical reaction is negative external pressure multiplied by the change in the volume. And this last relationship is how we're gonna wind up calculating any work done by a chemical reaction that produces a gaseous product, so it causes a container to expand in its size. And when you talk about delta V, the same phenomenon we use for temperature we use here, delta V will be final volume minus initial volume. So let's do an example. Let's calculate the work when a gas contracts from 56.0 liters to 42.0 liters against a pressure of 18.0 atmospheres. So if we wanna calculate the work, work's gonna be negative P delta V. So if it's contracting against a pressure of 18 atmospheres, that means P in our equation is 18.0 atmospheres. Delta V is gonna be final volume minus initial volume. So that's gonna be 42 liters minus 56 liters. That'll come out a negative number. And so when we go negative of 18 times negative 14, we'll get a positive work value. And to three significant figures, this comes out 252. So it makes sense it's positive. The gas is being contracted. That means the surrounding is doing work on our gas, which is our system. And so if work is done on the system, it's a positive value. Now, if you pay attention to units, the units of work are liter atmospheres. That's a unit of energy, not a very common unit of energy. So once we calculate work, we probably like to switch it into a different energy unit like joules. And it turns out one liter atmosphere is equivalent to 101.3 joules. So I can make a little dimensional analysis conversion now, and we can determine how many joules of energy must have been absorbed uh, by this particular gas. And that comes out to three significant figures, 25,500 joules. Or if that number is too big for you, you can make it 25.5 kilojoules. Let's try one more example. Let's say 0 0.805 moles of a gas with a molar heat capacity of 9.75 joules per mole Celsius degrees are placed in a 2.50 liter container at 20.0 degrees Celsius. The temperature increases from 20.0 degrees Celsius to 33.0 degrees Celsius, and the container expands to 3.75 liters against a pressure of 1.04 atmospheres. Okay, so what we're gonna try to do is we're gonna try to explain what's happened here thermodynamically, and we're gonna try to solve for every thermodynamic function we have talked about so far. We're gonna try to calculate Q, W, delta E, and delta H for the gas. So the way you calculate Q for a material is it's not from a calorimetry experiment. We're not finding a Q for a reaction. We're trying to find Q for a material and it's a gas. That would be like in a calorimeter, how do we find Q for water? And we do that with its heat capacity. So they've given us the heat capacity of the gas. It's 9.75 joules per mole Celsius degree. So because it's a molar heat capacity, I'm gonna take the heat capacity, multiply by the moles of gas, and multiply by the change in temperature of the gas. So in this case, because we're given the molar heat capacity, the amount of heat absorbed or released by the gas will be Cn delta T. So the molar heat capacity, 9.75 joules per mole Celsius degree. We have 0 0.805 moles of gas, and the temperature change, final minus initial, 33.0 minus 20.0 is 13.0 degrees Celsius. And when the units cancel out, we wind up having an answer in joules, and to three significant figures, 102 joules. To calculate work, we're gonna go negative P delta V. So if the external pressure is 1.04 atmospheres and the change in the volume, which has to be final minus initial, is 3.75 minus 2.50, that change in volume is 1.25 liters. So if we go negative pressure times change in volume, we'll get a negative value I get negative 1.30 liter atmospheres. And to convert this into joules, which is the more common unit for energy, I would multiply this by 101.3 joules per liter atmosphere. And this comes out negative 131.7 joules, which would be rounded to negative 132 joules. If you wanna calculate the change in internal energy for the gas, this is the first law of thermodynamics, Q plus W. 
we have our two values already calculated. You always have to calculate them first to get a delta E. So it'll be 102 then plus a negative 132. And this comes out negative 29.7 or rounded to the ones place because it's an addition problem and the two numbers are accurate each to the ones place, negative 30 joules. Finally, to get the enthalpy change for the gas, the enthalpy change always equals the amount of heat gained or lost as long as the external pressure is constant. And it said you had a pressure of 1.04 atmospheres. So that means this particular experiment match meets the conditions for where delta H equals Q. And to specify that delta H does equal Q when the pressure is constant, they put a subscript P after the Q to let you know that that heat given off or absorbed was at constant pressure. And so because the Q value is 102, the enthalpy change value will be 102 as well. So for test five, let's go through the things that you're going to need to be ready for. I would like you to know from the gas law chapter, Avogadro's law, Boyle's law, and Charles law. You should know the units for temperature and pressure and be able to convert between Celsius and Kelvin and be able to convert between Tor, millimeters of mercury, and atmospheres. You should know the numerical values for standard temperature and pressure, standard temperature zero degrees Celsius, standard pressure one atmosphere. You should know what graphs uh, look like mathematically if they're going to be direct or inverse relationships. For a direct relationship, two variables are in the numerator on opposite sides of an equal sign. For an inverse relationship, two variables are on the same side of the equal sign, both in the numerator. I will ask you to graph variables, and the graph may come out a straight line, may not. If a graph does not come out a straight line, I will ask you to produce a graph for those two variables that will create a straight line. And there were three ways we learned to do that, graphing the reciprocal of one variable, graphing the logs of both, or graphing the product of the two on one of the axes. You should know the ideal gas law equation so you can solve for any variable in it. I'll expect you to be able to do calculations involving the ideal gas law equation when density is involved, and that's when you'll have to use PV equals M over molar mass, RT, because that equation has M over V in it, which is density. I'll expect you to be able to calculate mole fractions. That will allow you to be able to determine partial pressures of gases, so you need to know the partial pressure equation. And then we talked about when you collect a gas in lab by water displacement, some of the water will evaporate into that container. And so you'll know that you'll have to subtract out any water vapor pressure if you want the partial pressure of your particular gas you're collecting. So you'll need to be able to handle that. So I'll give you pictures and ask you to tell me what the pressure of a gas is collected in a udiometer by water displacement or mercury displacement, or a gas that's attached to a manometer that has mercury or some other liquid in it. Then we dealt with chemical reaction stoichiometry involving gases. From our last test, you already knew how to take experimental data of mass and convert it into moles with the molar mass. You can take solution data and convert it into moles with molarity equals N over, N over V. And now you can switch gas data, gas volume data into moles with PV equals NRT. I'll expect you to know the relationships of temperature to kinetic energy and temperature to velocity. You should be able to calculate the root mean square velocity for any gas. And then I'll expect you to be able to use Graham's law, which is valuable when you're trying to calculate the molar mass of an unknown gas, where you actually cause a gas of known molar mass to effuse under similar conditions. Then we ended up talking about what an ideal gas was. I'd like you to know why real gases deviate from ideal behavior. And then I would like you to be able to explain to me what the Van der Waal equation means and what the constants are and be able to explain why some constant values are big for one gases and small for others. Then we did talk about atmospheric pollution. We talked about the ozone layer and greenhouse gases. So there may be some questions involving those concepts as well. The final chapter was on thermochemistry. We talked about heat and change in enthalpy, which are essentially the same things, heat given off or absorbed or change in enthalpy as long as the reaction occurs at constant pressure are identical to each other. We learned how to calculate the enthalpy change of a reaction from bond energy, so you'll be expected to do that. Uh, we talked about how a coffee cup calorimeter works, and I expect you to be able to do calculations from data from a coffee cup calorimeter. And we talked about how a bomb calorimeter works, and I'll expect you to be able to do calculations based upon data from bomb calorimeters. 
And then we were able to calculate enthalpy changes of reactions from calorimeters experimentally. Then we discussed what a state function is. You should know that definition. And we introduced Hess's law because Hess's law can apply to enthalpy changes of reactions because enthalpy is a state function. And I would like you to be able to theoretically calculate an enthalpy change for reaction from Hess's law, which is where we add reactions together and then add up their enthalpy changes. Then we introduced a, something called a formation reaction. And we talked about if formation reactions are occurring under standard state conditions, you can calculate what's called or get a standard heat of formation. And then we are able to use standard heat of formations in one final method in order to calculate theoretical enthalpy changes of reactions. So I would like you to be able to calculate an enthalpy change for a reaction from standard heat of formations, and that's heat of formation of products minus heat of formation of reactants. And then finally, we talked about uh, the concept of fossil fuels. That was actually in the reading in chapter six, so you should probably know that. We learned how to calculate Q, W, delta E, and delta H. That was actually the last problem we had just done, so you should be able to calculate any thermodynamic property for a particular change. We talked about the first law of thermodynamics. You should know that. And the first law involves both heat and work. You should know those definitions and they involve the, the change in internal energy of a system, so know what that stands for. Experiments 22 and 23 are related to these two chapters, and of course you'll do the reading, and that should pretty much be it.